On the 11th of November 1988, in a quiet street in Sacramento, California, a grim discovery was made. The reason for cutting off her head, hands and feet were if by some chance someone did find the body, they wouldn't know who it was. A terrible crime was about to be unearthed, and with it, the cold, dark secrets of a serial killer no one would ever suspect. People never took this case seriously in terms of what it was, which was mass murder. 385 miles north of Los Angeles, Sacramento County sits in the heart of the expansive Central Valley. Sacramento is its largest city and also serves as its state capital. Sacramento in the mid 80s was still considered by, by most to be a, a, a small town. It was, it was growing, but it uh, still had a very small town feel. Neighborhoods were expanding and there was a lot of building going on and there were people coming and going, but it was just, it's always been a growing city, you know, and, and a very likable town, likable place to be in. We had our issues just like most of the growing cities, you know, going around town. During that time period in the early 80s or mid 80s, we noticed a big spike in our homicide rate. By the late 80s, Sacramento residents were also noticing an increase in the number of homeless people that roamed the city's streets. Northern California in general is a good destination for homeless people. Uh, California has a very generous benefits program for homeless people, and the weather's mild, um, the people are tolerant. Some residents were more than tolerant. They wanted to help. In 1988, Judy Moyes was a street counselor for a group called the Volunteers of America. My job in the 80s was to locate people who were not getting services on the street and who were living um, homeless and mentally ill, unable to actually do it themselves. One case in particular attracted Judy's attention. A 51-year-old schizophrenic who talked to voices only he could hear. His name was Alberto Gonzalez Montoya, known affectionately as Bert. Charmed by Bert's gentle, childlike nature, Judy decided to find him a decent place to live. Not far from the state capital, she found a boarding house often used by social workers to accommodate difficult people. 1426 F Street was in a neighborhood that had seen better days, but the blue and white Victorian house with its pretty garden was a pleasant surprise, as was its white-haired landlady, Dorothea Puente. She said that she was in her 70s and that she had actually been an, a nurse in the uh, Battle of Bataan during World War II. And I was very impressed with that. Known for donating money and clothes to charity and employing people on parole from the local halfway house to carry out various jobs, Dorothea Puente also had a grandmotherly concern for her tenants. I think what made the boarding house that Puente had very popular uh, with social workers and social agencies is the fact that she uh, opened her arms to all. Uh, these are individuals with uh, alcoholic problems, um, maybe drug problems, uh, some mental problems. Most of Dorothea's tenants were elderly with a litany of health problems. James Gallup was a 62-year-old down and outer with a brain tumor. Dorothy Miller was a 64-year-old alcoholic. Betty Palmer and Leona Carpenter, both in their late 70s, were unable to fend for themselves. All of Dorothea's boarders um, were receiving various kinds of benefits, and she knew how to work the system. So if there was any way that they could get more, she would get more for them. Despite Dorothea Puente's care and kindness, Gallup, Miller, Palmer, and Carpenter had all moved out by the time Bert Montoya moved in on the 3rd of February, 1988. Another boarder, 62-year-old Vera Faye Martin, stayed just two days before leaving without a word. That's not uncommon with people that live in these boarding houses. Uh, they could just get up one day and walk away or move to another facility or whatever. Bert and his fellow boarders lived on the main floor of the house, each in their own bedroom. 64-year-old retired cook John Sharp didn't drink, but his neighbor, 55-year-old Ben Fink, had made a life of it. 
Benjamin Fink um, had a long history of uh, checking into the ER with very high alcohol levels. Uh, after he got his check, he would go on binges and, and be a real heavy drinker. After one of those binges in April 1988, Fink also disappeared. But his social worker wasn't surprised. Once again, another transient tenant had moved on. Bert Montoya, however, seemed to blossom under Dorothea Puente's loving care. We came back and he had a very nice haircut. He was very clean and uh, he had some very nice clothes. He, it, it was amazing, the transformation. And we were just delighted that, uh, that he was getting the kind of help that he really needed. Over the summer of 1988, Bert continued to thrive and Judy felt confident that everything was going to be all right. In November, however, Sacramento police received a call from a woman wanting to file a missing persons report. The woman was Judy Moyes, and the missing person was Bert Montoya. On the 7th of November, 1988, in Sacramento, police officer Richard Ewing met up with homeless volunteer Judy Moyes. She was concerned about one of her clients, 51-year-old schizophrenic Bert Montoya. He'd been missing for several weeks, and his disappearance from the boarding house where he lived didn't add up. Alberto had been uh, at Dorothea Puente's, I think about six months. And one of the staff people said, hey, guess what happened? I said, what? And he said, Alberto went with the room and board people down to Mexico to visit Dorothea's uh, doctor brother. Judy told the officer that when she called Dorothea Puente, the elderly landlady assured her that Bert would return in a few days. When he still hadn't returned after several weeks, Judy informed Dorothea that she was going to bring in the police. A few days later, the social worker received a phone call at work. I answered the phone and this man said, uh, hello, this is Don Anthony. I mean, Michelle Obregon. And I have uh, Alberto with me. He's my nephew. And he is with me in um, Utah. We're in Shreveport, Utah. Afterwards, when Judy called Dorothea, the elderly woman confirmed the same thing. And she said, well, you know what? Sunday while I was at mass, uh, a relative of his came by and just packed him up and took him, left a note for me. And I said, uh-huh, yeah, well, listen, I'm calling the police because the story had a lot of holes in it and she was obviously covering. Judy urged Officer Ewing to go to the boarding house at 1426 F Street to investigate. I told him that there was a person that was living in the home named John Sharp, and that he was a person that he could get the correct information from. John didn't have a mental illness. He wasn't an alcoholic like the other uh, residents. And I felt that he would give him a, a, the true version of whatever did happen. So uh, Officer Ewing went over to Dorothea's home shortly after that. The landlady was as gracious as ever, showing the officer around and answering his questions. He also talked to John Sharp, who confirmed that Bert Montoya had left with a relative the previous morning. Satisfied that Dorothea was telling the truth, Officer Ewing closed up his notebook. But just as he was leaving, he was approached by John Sharp. One of the tenants passed him a note, and on the note, it uh, asked the officer to meet him at another location because he had something to tell the officer. So the officer uh, subsequently met that particular tenant away from everybody else, and that tenant told him that uh, Dorothea had asked the tenants to lie and to say that Bert had left with relatives. Sharp also shared his suspicions of strange goings on at the boarding house the sound of something being dragged down the stairs the night Ben Fink moved out, and of a foul smell coming from a room upstairs. He told the officer 
that there were suspicious holes dug in the yard and that he thought people were being buried in the yard. He had a suspicion of that. The officer then contacted Detective Sergeant John Cabrera of Missing Persons and Homicide. Then you start doing all the checks that you can, you know, driver's license, all of the uh, uh, primary checks. Well, the first thing I found is that she was on federal parole for forgery of social security checks and also for putting stupefying drugs in her victim's uh, drinks. Cabrera discovered that on at least four occasions between 1981 and 1982, Dorothea Puente posed as a nurse, then drugged her elderly patients in order to steal jewelry, blank checks, and credit cards. When police arrested her in late April 1982, they found in her handbag a ticket to Mexico. Sentenced to five years in prison, Dorothea was released in 1985 on good behavior and moved back to the house on F Street where she lived before her conviction. Things started to become a little bit more clear that this could be, you know, right in line with the person missing. He was receiving Social Security money. Uh, nobody knew his whereabouts. And Cabrera discovered something else. According to her file, Dorothea Puente was only 59 years old. She lied to Judy Moyes and told her she was in her 70s. And she had, uh, she had no teeth, so without her teeth and with her silver hair, she could look much older than she was. Detective Cabrera then told Judy Moyes all he'd discovered about Dorothea Puente. So then Detective Cabrera said, so, so what is it you want us to do? I said, I want you to go to the house. He said, do you want us to bring shovels? I said, sure. <laughs> On Friday, the 11th of November, 1988, detectives John Cabrera and Terry Brown and parole agent James Wilson arrived at the boarding house to question Dorothea Puente. I explained to her why we were there because of the report with Bert Montoya. And uh, she didn't seem mad or she didn't seem uh, upset about anything. She just said, oh yeah, you know, and she mentioned Judy Moise and that Bert had gone with relatives. And Dorothea was very believable in anything she said. She would look straight at you, tell you exactly, you know, what she was thinking or what she had to say. And uh, she didn't even flinch a moment when I asked her to search her house. I checked everything. I looked under beds. I tapped the walls, you know, but I had to keep in mind that Bert was a rather big person. So um, if he was gonna be stuffed somewhere, it would be pretty obvious. Although he saw no sign of Bert Montoya, Cabrera did find two prescription bottles in Dorothea's bedroom. One was missing its top and filled with blue capsules. The other was empty and on the floor. And I looked at it and it had the name of Dorothy Miller. And so I took that pill vial I went back out into the living room where Dorothea was sitting with uh, the other officers. And I said, who's Dorothy Miller? And I remember her telling me, Dorothy Miller was a relative of hers. You know, and she had come and visited with her and probably left that behind. With the preliminary search of the house complete, Detective Cabrera asked for permission to begin digging in the garden. I remember her kind of asking, you know, why I wanted to dig in the yard. And I told her, well, you know, I had some information that uh, maybe the, somebody was buried there. She didn't even flinch. She said, oh yeah, you know, please feel free. She even assisted us by getting us another shovel. For Cabrera, obtaining Dorothea's consent was vital to this stage of the investigation. And uh, we didn't need a search warrant at that particular time. We started digging into three particular areas in this little garden area. And it was about maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes later, we started pulling up articles out of one of the holes that looked to be like a material. And then we had this pile of leather looking uh, small discs uh, that, that accompanied the find of this material. As the officers dug further down, 
they hit a tree root they couldn't dislodge with their shovels. I climbed into the hole and I kept pulling on it and pulling on it. And then eventually it broke loose. And when I'm sitting in the back of this hole and I'm looking down at this object in my hand, it's not a tree root. It was a human bone, is what it appeared to me. And that was the beginning. Cabrera took Puente to show her the freshly dug hole in her once immaculate garden. We brought her down, walked her over to the hole and said, take a look there. You know, and she gave it one of these, <gasps> you know, she gasped and oh my gosh, and she became real nervous and uh, kind of upset and she didn't know what to think and didn't know anything about this and, uh, and she was very believable. What Dorothea was shown was the bone from a human leg, a foot encased in a shoe, and two types of material, one light and soft, the other tough and coarse. We determined that the cloth material appeared to look like what, what might have been a dress or some type of blouse item. After being called to the scene, Deputy Coroner Laura Santos decided to wait until a proper forensic team could be assembled before investigating any further. We should have a, a, you know, a crime scene set up. Someone should guard the property at, tonight until tomorrow and everybody can regroup. And that's what was done, basically. Along with that, I requested CSI so that that particular CSI officer could come out and now start photographing the scene uh, and anything and everything that we deem to be evidentiary as far as uh, um, the property. By the following morning, Saturday the 12th of November, local residents had gathered to witness the goings on. A canopy protected the garden from rain as the growing crowd, which now included the media, watched from the street. The area was so uh, congested with traffic and news reporters and the big satellite trucks that I remember I drove around in circles trying to find a way in. In the garden, forensic archaeologists supervised the careful recovery of the delicate remains. All of the dirt that was taken out was set aside to be screened for evidence. The corpse was that of an elderly female, definitely not the body of Bert Montoya police decided to continue digging. Got a call on that Saturday morning from the, um, uh, the Chronicle in San Francisco. They had heard about the story and uh, uh, one of their contacts had, I believe, spoken with somebody in the police department and uh, had gotten the information that um, they were gonna start a pretty major search and there was uh, potential for, for more bodies. If you look at this property, there really wasn't a whole lot of yard there, but it was enough that if you had to do it by shovel, it would take you probably a considerable amount of days. So we requested a backhoe to come in and to assist us in digging the entire yard. As the digging began, Dorothea Puente asked to speak to Detective John Cabrera. She said, am I under arrest? Well, at that particular time, she wasn't. And so, you know, I said, well, no, you're not under arrest, and why? And she said, you know, all this is making me nervous, and I would like to go have a cup of coffee with one of my relatives, just around the corner at the hotel. Because she'd been so helpful and cooperative, police did not consider her a flight risk. After getting the okay, Cabrera escorted Dorothea through the crowd and walked her to the hotel. Somewhere I've got a picture of her standing there talking to Cabrera just as she was getting ready to walk away. Just a matronly little old lady. That's all she was. I mean, it just, she didn't look like she could hurt a fly. And I mean, she was just nice about everything. But I still had that feeling in the back of my head. You know, there's just something here. She's just too nice. Not long after his return, Detective Cabrera realized just how right his intuition was. And it was about 21 minutes later that I was digging in this area that I struck something. And I 
dug down deeper and I pulled. And when I did, all of a sudden, here came a lake. And at that point, I knew it was definitely something had gone on here. I stopped. I immediately yelled for my uh, commander. I remember him asking me, where's Dorothea? I said, she's over at the hotel having coffee. He ran off to get her. A few minutes later, he comes back. He says, she's gone. And I remember that sinking feeling, you know, that uh, the reason she had summoned me is because I was probably maybe two feet away from discovering that body. And she wasn't about to be there when I pulled it up. No one expected Dorothea to, to run. And it created quite the media storm at the time because uh, it, it, no one knew where she'd gone. I mean, she just disappeared. The search for Dorothea Puente was underway by the time police found a third body. Like the first two, it was carefully exhumed using garden trowels and brushes. This body was wrapped in numerous layers of wrapping quilts, uh, bedspreads, plastic, um, and some of it was stitched together. And so we couldn't see anything at that point, and we didn't want to disturb any of the evidence. Two forensic pathologists from my office came over to the site to see what the body looked like in position and they made their own notes and things. And then the whole board with the body and all the evidence, all the wrappings was transported to the coroner's office in a van. Excavation of the garden continued as police looked for anyone who could shed light on the events at 1426 F Street. Dorothea's next door neighbor recalled a foul stench in May that was so bad he couldn't use his air conditioning. When uh, she was contacted, she just simply told him that uh, she just put some fertilizer out in her yard and that probably is the origin of the smell. The neighbor also showed police a discovery he had made in his own garden that very morning. He went out in the morning in the backyard and he found 24 human teeth, all of them filled with silver and gold uh, fillings. Obviously she knew that the, the heat was on. Social workers provided lists of those placed at the boarding house over the previous 18 months, including John Sharp and Ben Fink. Detective Cabrera also recognized another name, Dorothy Miller, the woman that Dorothea told him was a relative. On Sunday the 13th of November, there was still no sign of the missing landlady, and the story was front page news. In the garden, investigators uncovered two more bodies, also wrapped in cloth and plastic. It was like something was spoiled. But I have photographs of people holding their hands up to their mouths, you know, just covering their nose so they don't smell it. Some were wearing like those little face masks. Um, so yeah, it was definitely the smell was, was in the air. It was obvious almost right from the beginning that some of them had been buried much longer than others. Some appeared to have only been buried maybe a few weeks to a couple of months. Some appeared to have been buried for a year or two. The rates of decomposition were greatly different. Police also determined that Dorothea Puente did not dig the holes herself. We would discover the parolees from the halfway house came and dug the holes, but they didn't have any idea what was really gonna be put in the holes. She paid them cash, they went about their way. Um, there was nothing unusual as far as the holes being dug. Detectives also discovered that one of the ex-convicts was Don Anthony, the man who'd phoned Judy Moyes posing as Bert Montoya's relative. More evidence that linked Puente to Bert Montoya's disappearance. On Monday the 14th of November, police pulled down a shed in the middle of the back garden and discovered a shallow grave underneath. Later that day, they uncovered another body in the front garden. The picture that stands out the most in my mind is a photograph that I took of a uh, city worker uh, digging in the front yard, and he was digging right next to a statue of the Virgin Mary. I thought it was really ironic that this person was buried right underneath this statue. And uh, what was uh, 
different about this particular body is that the remains had no head, no hands, and no feet. The reason for cutting off her head, hands, and feet were if by some chance someone did find the body, they wouldn't know who it was. On Tuesday the 15th, police obtained a search warrant to go back inside the boarding house. We were able to gather up uh, somewhere probably over 300 items of evidence uh, from the outside and the interior of the boarding house. I found a book right on the table and the book was drugs and their effects. So basically, I just looked at it as this was Dorothea's cookbook. And then along on the, uh, on the kitchen table, I found a driver's license. And the driver's license had Dorothea's picture on it, but not Dorothea's name. So she had already gone to the point where she was changing driver's license belonging to her victims and putting her picture on it. In one of the bedrooms, Detective Cabrera experienced the same odor that resident John Sharp first noticed in May. Apparently, this is the room she kept her victims in. And they might have been there up to a week, maybe two weeks. And the body fluids would uh, penetrate the carpet and then down into the floor. And this is what created a very foul smell. And when we rolled the carpet back, it was very, very bad. I mean, it was just amazing that these things were just laid out in the open because, you know, there was no question. I believe she never thought she was going to be found out. Wednesday, the 16th of November, 1988. A two-story boarding house in Sacramento, California, had become front page news as police searched nationwide for its landlady, Dorothea Puente. Media from all over the world started showing up. We had uh, TV crews from Germany and Japan, um, England. The discovery of seven bodies in the garden had also captured the imagination of local residents. At one point, the, the, the full city block in front of her house there on F Street was shoulder to shoulder with people from sidewalk to sidewalk. Kids in their parochial school uniforms, uh, Sacramento lobbyists on their luncheon breaks, and it's everybody standing out there, they began to decorate their houses with Nightmare on F Street posters. It was, it was a circus. At the Sacramento coroner's office, the post-mortem began on the first victim. One of the initial things identified was the leather-like material dug up by Cabrera and the other detectives. They said, you know what that stuff was? I said, no, they said, it was just the flesh. It come off the, you know, it was petrifying. It was come off the body. Yeah, it made me uh, kind of uh, cringe uh, for a moment. The usual means of identification of victims in a case like this is number one, fingerprints number two dental records but in this case most of the bodies were too decomposed to do fingerprints and all but one of the the victims um, did not have any teeth we actually received an offer of help from the social security department and one of their agents from san francisco offered to give us a list of everyone who had received social security benefits at that address for the past three or four years the list didn't specify who actually received the money sent to the F Street address, but it was becoming clear to police that it was Dorothea Puente. She just made it a point when their checks came at the end of each month, she went out and got the mail. And then she would bring the money in, and then she told her tenants that she would take care of their money. Some people on the list hadn't been living at the boarding house for more than a year, including Vera Faye Martin, Dorothy Miller, James Gallup, and Leona Carpenter. Betty Palmer had not been seen for more than two years. But still, their benefit checks came to the F Street address because no one had reported them missing. Dorothy Puente chose her victims carefully. She chose people to live there who didn't have a lot of contact with their families or didn't have any family at all. 
and they were isolated. And so most of them had no one that was looking for them. But there was one family that was looking for a lost relative. Detective John Cabrera received a phone call inquiring about 77-year-old Everson Gilmouth. He had not been in contact with his family since late 1985, after leaving for California to get married. His intended bride, Dorothea Puente. What makes this most interesting is the fact that during this period from 1986 to 1988, she was still in contact with his family through letters, always telling them about how she and Everson was doing things and traveling and all of this. In fact, it wasn't until this case had hit the news media that the family made contact with me wanting to know how their father was. I didn't quite know what they were t referring to or what they were talking about. Detective Cabrera was also contacted by William Clausen about another suspicious death at Puente's boarding house more than six years earlier. The victim was his mother, Ruth Munro. Cabrera learned that in 1982, she was a 61-year-old grandmother dreading the thought of living alone after her husband had been hospitalized with terminal cancer. A friend offered the perfect solution. Since she and Ruth were partners in a catering business already, why not share a house as well? The name of Ruth's partner, Dorothea Puente. The address, 1426 F Street. My brother and I moved her in on Easter Sunday. And I stopped by every day after work. I'd go by and see her. About two weeks went by, and then uh, I noticed my mom had a drink in her hand, and she didn't drink. So I asked her what it was, and she said that Dorothea had fixed her a drink to calm her down. Bill Clausen told Detective Cabrera that on the evening of the 27th of April, 1982, he visited his mother again, but this time Ruth was in bed, unable to move or speak. So I kind of sat on the edge of the bed, put my hand on her, kind of pulled her down a little bit and told her that she was, she'd was she be okay, that Dorothea was taking care of her, you know, everything was okay. And then I left. The next morning I got a phone call that she was dead. Well, the autopsy report came back as undetermined overdose classified as a suicide. And so the coroner showed up and investigated and found that uh, Ruth allegedly had died from this overdose of uh, a mixture of, uh, you know, drugs. And so there wasn't any reason to suspect that any foul play had taken place because what Dorothea had told the authorities is that Ruth Monroe at that particular time was a very depressed person contrary to later on we would find from her family that that wasn't so. She was upbeat, she was happy, and then the next minute she's dead, and then here's Dorothea telling authorities, oh, uh, she was a very depressed person. It suddenly dawned on Cabrera that at the time of Ruth's death in April 1982, Dorothea was about to go to prison for drugging elderly patients. She needed to escape, and Ruth Munro was a ready source of cash. Cash that likely paid for the ticket to Mexico found on Puente at the time of her arrest. And so given that circumstances, we added Ruth's death now as a homicide. With Dorothea still on the run, police were tracking their suspect and following leads in Las Vegas. Then, on the evening of Wednesday, the 16th of November, the Los Angeles Police Department received a call from the Las Vegas local TV news office. A retired handyman had contacted the office, saying that he'd just spent the afternoon in a bar with the woman being sought by Sacramento police. 
during this time that they were together, the subject of conversation was him receiving Social Security benefits. And so he called the authorities. And uh, they went out to where he knew she was staying. At 10.20 p.m., Los Angeles police approached a room at a local motel. A woman answered the door. And at first, she gave them a different name when they asked who she was. But they didn't buy into that, and they wanted to know, you know, see some ID or something along that line. And it was at that time she just said, OK, my name is Dorothea Puente. She wasn't very talkative, but uh, she was very open about, you know, her cashing the victim's checks. And, and I remember her apologizing, but she was very adamant about uh, cashing the checks, but not killing anybody. Somebody had called me and told me that they were bringing her in. So I went out to the executive airport, and that's where they brought her in. They got her off the plane. She's handcuffed and just a little old grandma-looking type. You know, that uh, wouldn't think she could do anything. There was, however, enough circumstantial evidence to charge Dorothea Puente for the murder of Bert Montoya. I don't think anybody ever lost any sleep over Dorothea Puente being on the lam. People never took this case seriously in terms of what it was, which was mass murder. Meanwhile, the coroner's office was working in shifts to identify the seven victims and establish how they died. The fourth body was an adult male with four tattoos, markings that identified 55-year-old Ben Fink. The pathologists were able to lift fingerprints off only two of the bodies, one female and one male. Military records confirmed that the female victim was Dorothy Miller. The male victim, Bert Montoya. Judy Moyes' worst fears had been confirmed. I think that if Dorothea Puente had a motive for killing Alberto, it was that he knew too much and that he knew too many people that he could report that this was done. Soon, the names of the remaining victims were added to the list. James Gallup, Leona Carpenter, Vera Faye Martin, and Betty Palmer. All seven bodies had now been identified, but not cause of death. Still, there was a pattern. I had noticed that all the bodies that we were bringing up were uh, dressed in a particular way. Uh, they were uh, wrapped with a lot of duct tape, plastic, sheets, I put out a bulletin to all agencies asking if they'd had any bodies that were found in this similar manner. And shortly after I had put it out, Sutter County uh, homicide detectives got a hold of me and said, yeah, you know, in 1986, we had a body found. The body was identified as 77-year-old Everson Gilmouth, the man who came to California to marry Dorothea Puente. On the 19th of June, 1990, Dorothea Puente was charged with nine counts of murder, including the deaths of Ruth Munro and Everson Gilmouth. The trial that followed would be almost as shocking as the crimes themselves. On the 9th of February, 1993, almost five years after the first human bone was uncovered in the garden in Sacramento, the murder trial of Dorothea Puente finally began. Delays had plagued the case for more than two years, including a change of venue hearing that moved the trial to another location due to the amount of publicity in Sacramento. The prosecution produced testimony from 156 witnesses and more than 3,000 exhibits. No one testified to seeing Dorothea Puente actually kill or bury anyone. And in all the deaths except Ruth Munro's, there was no clear cause. Just because the coroner cannot determine the cause of death doesn't mean we can't classify a death as a homicide. And obviously, since these people were buried, many of them were bound, wrapped, you know, it was pretty obvious they didn't dig holes and jump in themselves. There was a reason they were in these, these graves and someone else had to be involved. The defense didn't in fact deny that Dorothea Puente stole her tenants' benefits, nor that she even buried them in her garden. Despite the presence of the drug Dalmain in all the buried bodies, 
the defense argued that it was not the cause of death. That became really critical during the trial because the defense was trying to portray that these people died of natural causes. Um, and indeed, they were, they had every illness you could name. So if you can't prove cause of death, can you prove murder? Their point of view was that um, they just simply died and then she buried them and continued to, to collect their checks. On the 15th of July, the jury retired to deliberate without hearing testimony from the accused. Dorothea Pointy did not take the stand. John O'Mara was a very good, very tenacious prosecutor and Dorothea Pointy would be no match for him on the stand. On the 26th of August, 1993, after 43 days, the longest trial deliberation in Californian history, the jury announced it had reached a verdict. Out of nine counts of murder, she was convicted on three of them. Four of those counts, which were four bodies and victims out of her yard, uh, would go 11 to 1. That is 11 guilty, one not guilty. Uh, two of the cases would evenly split. The jury found Dorothea Puente guilty of first-degree murder in the deaths of Ben Fink and Dorothy Miller and of second-degree murder in the death of Leona Carpenter. As for the other six counts, the judge declared a mistrial, including those related to Ruth Munro and Bert Montoya. On the 13th of October, 1993, Dorothea Puente was sentenced to life in prison without parole. She was sentenced to two life terms without parole and then an additional 25 to life on those three counts. In the wake of the Puente case, regulations regarding Social Security were tightened and a national database set up to keep better track of applicants' whereabouts. For many of those involved in the case, life after Dorothea Puente was never the same. Personally, I wasn't able to work anymore as a street counselor. I did stay for another six months, but I no longer had that type of enthusiasm for it. Even now, there's times coming home from work, I think of going to see mom. And then I remember, no. Oh, She's not there. Dorothea Puente will remain in prison for the rest of her life. When you think of a mass murderer, you don't think of a grandmotherly type of uh, lady. Um, she appeared more like somebody that uh, would be baking cookies for the neighborhood children. I'm most grateful for Alberto because if it weren't for him, she wouldn't have, have been caught. I can remember his smile is uh, his warmth and his caring. If the police hadn't discovered bodies, she would have continued to um, kill and uh, cash checks. I think that um, she definitely got what uh, she deserved. And there are people still today that I run into that still shake their head and just in disbelief and want to just tell me, you know, I don't, I don't know, did she really do that? And, of course, my answer was, yes. She did every one of them. Hopefully, hopefully she won't live much longer. And then she'll, she'll meet her maker. Her punishment is still coming.